But Brigham Young's made the determination that they're going to leave. They, they look at a lot of different places. Uh, they, they look really closely at going to the Republic of Texas, which was an independent country at the time. The president of the Republic of Texas had actually invited them to come. Joseph had looked into that while he was alive. But once Texas is annexed to the United States, they drop that as an option because they feel like they need to get out of the United States. In the United States, whether it was in New York or Ohio or Missouri or Illinois, no matter where they went, even if it was a less populated part of the state like Western Missouri and Western Illinois, it didn't matter because as a, as a persecuted minority group, as a hated minority group, it was always more politically expedient to, to be against them than for them. So their plan is to go somewhere else and they settle on thinking on the Rocky Mountains. They plan to leave in the, the, the spring of 1846. They plan to leave in April or May, which is would be that's intelligence. The, that's the time to that, leave. That's when you should start in your journey west. Um, but they actually leave with an even more bitter taste in their mouth than they had, than they had anticipated. So Thomas Ford, the governor of Illinois, who many Latter-day Saints do not like because of his involvement in Joseph's murder, um, he's not done yet hurting the Latter-day Saints. He will um, uh, lie to the Latter-day Saints. He'll lie to Brigham Young and to the sheriff of the county and tell them that the federal government has decided to intervene and that they are sending an army to Nauvoo and they're going to arrest all of the apostles and they're going to gather up a bunch of the other saints and they're going to prevent them from leaving the country. Well, this, this is terrifying to, to the Latter-day Saints. And imagine how frustrated they were. For a decade, they have been begging the U.S. government to get involved to help them from their lands that have been stolen, people that have been murdered indiscriminately in Missouri and now in Illinois. And now finally the government's going to get involved. But to their detriment, it, it is an exasperating thing. But fearing because Thomas Ford, and I'm not just saying Thomas Ford is a liar. Thomas Ford brags about being a liar. In his book, he writes in 1854, he's quite proud of himself. He's, he's excited about the fact that he lied so well. Um, uh, that, that the Latter-day Saints, um, seeing no, no option, realize they have to leave in the dead of winter. And so they leave in February rather than waiting until it was spring. They leave before they're totally ready. They leave when the weather is, of course, atrocious. And um, it makes a much more disorganized departure than they had intended. And Brigham Young had wanted a very organized departure. One thing that he was very adamant about, and you'll get to this in DNC 136, and the Lord will speak this as well. He did not want anyone left behind because they were poor. He did not want the price of discipleship to be whether or not you owned a wagon, that, that the people who had means had better sacrifice and get every believer out of there than anyone who wanted to believe. But this hurried nature of departure meant that people left in staggered stages because they, they weren't, I mean, if any of you have ever had to leave on a, on a major trip, just, you know, a week uh, long that you had to leave six hours before you thought you had to, you don't have anything when you get there. Imagine doing that here where they're planning to walk a thousand, 1500 miles um, uh, to, to it through a trackless uh, wilderness, essentially. So they, they get to, um, the other side of Iowa after incredible suffering. And um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of Latter-day Saints who die along the way. Um, because they leave in winter, it means that they're only partway through Iowa when the early spring rains come and the snow melt come. And so it turns Iowa into a giant mud bath. I mean, just, it, 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 it's, it, yes, that, to, let me put it this way. It takes the saints longer to get across Iowa than it will take them to get from Iowa to Salt Lake. That's, that tells you how horrific that, that 1846 was. And even when they get to winter quarters, when they get to the other side, uh, they get to the Missouri River, it, it is, a, is a terrible time. Um, th there's been a lot that's happened in the interim as they're crossing uh, Iowa, the United States government has shown up 
but not with an army to kill them, but to invite them to give volunteers to fight in the Mexican war that has, has, has uh, short, uh, lately broken out. And they send over 500 uh, men and, and, and women, actually uh, several dozen women, as uh, volunteers to fight in the Mormon battalion. And that greatly reduces their manpower. And so the idea is that they're going to have to wait there in winter quarters. So, so you have a lot of things that are going on that have created some disjointedness. You've had everybody has left everything they knew in Nauvoo. The cross of, uh, crossing of Iowa for that year was horrific. Dozens of people have lost family members. They are, they are in the middle. It, it is hard to describe. If you've never been to western Iowa or eastern Nebraska in the wintertime, it's hard to know how cold it is. Wilford Woodruff is recording in his journal. I don't know how accurate his thermometer is, but during the time period we're talking about that this revelation is received, he is regularly writing, thermometer at negative 10 below zero today. Thermometer at negative 15 below zero today. It is devastatingly cold. And um, as you might imagine, with how much struggle there had been, with how difficult things, with how much sacrifice people had made, and with the fact that people are readily, steadily dying here in this encampment, that people could start to murmur and start to say, well, maybe Brigham Young isn't the prophet who's supposed to be leading us. Maybe, maybe we should just go back. And some people did. Some people did and left and went back. Wilford Woodruff records in his journal just before this revelation. This revelation is received in January, uh, January 14th of 1847. In December of 1846, Wilford Woodruff uh, uh, records a meeting that's held where Brigham Young outlines some of the problems. Because it's kind of been this disjointed removal of the saints, uh, you have uh, a lack of organization, you have crime, you have people committing all kinds of sins, and Brigham Young lists them off to him. You must stop your lying. You must stop your thieving. You must stop your whoredoms. And then, uh, in a very Brigham Young-esque fashion, says, Brother Joseph bore with you these things because he was a very merciful man, but I will not. <laughs> uh, 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 he goes on to simply say that if we are going somewhere to create the kingdom of God, we can't do it with these people. We can't do it with people that are going to sin, with people who are going to attack their neighbors, who are going to lie and backbite. And so it, it, this is a, a really difficult time. As a historian, if you were a dispassionate, non-Latter-day Saint historian, you would view this winter of 46-47 as the make or break point of the movement of Latter-day Saints because it could have easily descended into, into chaos because of, of how many trials they were having. So it's in that context that Brigham Young receives this revelation. Yeah, this is, this is beautiful. The camp of Israel, right there on, in winter quarters, when verse one, the word and will of the Lord concerning the camp of Israel in their journeys to the west. To me, the most beautiful part about that isn't the fact that we get this revelation, it's not to show that Brother Brigham's in charge. To the, me, the Lord's in charge. it's that the Lord's in charge, <laughs> and, and he's now charge. going to yes. speak through yeah. Brother Brigham instead yeah. of through Brother Joseph. That to me is just, it's profound that it's not the church of Joseph and it's not the church of Brigham and it's not the church of any subsequent prophet. It's the church of Jesus Christ and he's giving his will through this, this man at that time in that location, in those very trying circumstances. Very difficult. Listen to the – knowing what you know now about what's been going on, listen to verse 2 in that context. Let all the people of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and those who journey with them be organized into companies with a covenant and a promise to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord our God. This isn't a suggestion. It's you have to covenant and promise you're going to do this as we organize you into companies, and then he gives this, this organization structure of in companies of hundreds and with captains of fifty and captains of tens, and you've got a president and two counselors at their head. There's, there's this very, very specific hierarchical structure. He's using Captain Moroni's, uh, uh, you know. Cap he's <laughs> right. using, I'll give a captain of a hundred and, uh, and, and also the, the, the fact that he is, the Lord is, is, 
telling them that they need to make this renewed covenant to who they are. One of the things that Brigham Young said in his December sermon was that many of the Latter-day Saints were actually justifying committing adultery, uh, stealing from their neighbor um, because of all the horrible things they'd been through. That, that well, sure, I might have committed adultery, but I also lost my house back in Nauvoo. So I think we're even God kind of thing. And, and so I think you also see some of that come out in the Revelation as well. Yeah. So after he gives some dis- uh, direct instructions regarding um, the teams and the seeds and the farming utensils in order to plant the spring <laughs> crops and making sure that we're, we're not leaving the poor behind, it comes out as well. Listen to what he says in verse 17 and 18. Go thy way, and do as I have told you, and fear not thine enemies, for they shall not have power to stop my work. Zion shall be redeemed in mine own due time. Have you noticed how God's prophets, even in the, the most terrible circumstances, I mean, this is, this is a real low point. It's a low point for the saints. But you'll notice that there's not a doom and gloom mentality coming from God through the prophet. It's, it's still planting those seeds of hope. It's giving them something to fight on to, to attain the Zion. It will be redeemed in mine own due time. Verse 19, and if any man shall seek to build up himself and seeketh not my counsel, he shall not have no power, and his folly shall be made manifest. I think Brother Brigham had a few people specifically in mind there when, he's, a lot of when he's getting that, that revelation. There are people that are trying to build themselves up, that's for sure. And 